be talking about diastolic dysfunction, diastolic function, or and why relaxation actually does matter. I don't have any industry-funded research, I don't have any honoraria, no speakers bureau, no free lunches. The dollar value is completely zero of any of my financial conflicts. So I'm going to start off by asking you a few questions. My first question is, what do you think about diastolic dysfunction? And you will probably fall into one of these categories, right? The first option is, you don't think it exists. I have news for you, it does. B, you may think that it exists, but you don't care. If you don't, you should, because you spend two-thirds of your life in it. Right? C, you care, but you don't know how to measure it. D, you can measure it, but you don't know what to do with the measurements. Or, you don't think. So chances are that you fall in either C or D, which is that you care, but you don't know how to measure it, or if you know how to measure it, you don't, want to, you don't know what to do next. So I'm here to help resolve some of those issues. And hopefully, I'll convert you, if you're in category A or B, to something else. Now, here's the second question. Now, here's a 68-year-old man undergoing cabbage surgery. He has the following findings on TEE. He has a normal ejection fraction, moderate concentric left ventricular hypertrophy, a transmitral E velocity of 78 centimeters per second, tissue Doppler lateral E prime velocity of 6 centimeters per second, no tricuspid regurgitation. This patient's diastolic function can be characterized as abnormal with a high filling pressure, abnormal with a normal filling pressure, normal, inconclusive, you need more information, or you'd rather call Dr. Shernan, who is actually not here right now, he's probably having his coffee. But you know, which one of these is it? And I've given you all the data that you will probably get. So if you're one of those who uh, cannot measure it, well, you've got your measurements in place, but then what do you do? What is the information telling you? We'll go through this later on in terms of what the data tells us and what the guidelines tell us as to what this all means. So I'll talk about what diastolic dysfunction is, why it's important, how do you measure it, is there a simpler way to do it, or is there a simple way to do it? And li like I said in the last topic, uh, in the last session, I'd really like to keep things simple and focused. It's a function of as you grow older, it, it becomes more and more difficult to retain complex stuff in your brain. And then the next question is, what do you do next? What do you do with that information? And so, and I'll end with a summary. So, what is diastolic dysfunction? Diastolic dysfunction, or LVDD, as I'll abbreviate it, is inefficient LV relaxation and compliance in diastole. There are two separate things. There's relaxation and there's compliance. They're two completely different things. They're related, though, but they're different. LV diastolic dysfunction is an echocardiographic diagnosis, which in contrast to heart failure, diastolic heart failure, is diastolic dysfunction with symptoms of heart failure. So that distinguishes between the two. So think about this water-filled balloon, for example. So I'm going to fill water into this, this balloon. It's nicely compliant. It's very elastic. So it starts filling up with water. And if you look at the pressure inside of it, you know, uh, it's not going to rise by very much if you keep filling volume into it. So I keep filling water. The balloon expands. The volume keeps growing. Right? The pressure doesn't, but the volume keeps growing. It keeps accepting more and more because it's such an elastic structure. It's relaxing. It's able to relax really well. But as I keep trying to fill more, it reaches its limits of relaxation. It reaches its limits of elasticity. It doesn't become very compliant, and the pressure keeps increasing, assuming it doesn't burst. So towards the end of this whole uh, pressure-volume relationship is the compliance aspect. Initially, it's the relaxation aspect. Why is it important? Why should I even care? So according to the 2017 AHA Heart Disease and Stroke Update, the prevalence of heart failure is, is quite large, and it's increasing as we go along. How much does it cost? Well, it's gone up from $30.7 billion in 2012, and it's projected to go up to about $70 billion. Now, this is, you know, you may start talking about millions and millions, and suddenly it becomes real money when you talk about $69.7 billion. The point being that it is an expensive issue. And this is just heart failure. And when you consider the difference between heart failure with preserved ejection fraction versus heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, they're almost half and half. 